I uh, could have your attention, please. I'm very thankful to be here because, <laughs> good, you got it. Okay, because the presentation is about happiness and thanksgiving, which is rather appropriate for the season, don't you think? My question to you is, do you want to be happy? And my answer is, then give thanks always. As a matter of fact, this question, do you want to be happy, somebody by the name of St. Augustine of Hippo said in the 400s, even before we get the question out of our mouths, the answer already erupts from the other person, yes, of course I want to be happy. What that means is there is this universal tendency towards happiness, a universal desire among us to be happy. Now, it's no surprise that authors have been writing about happiness for millennia. Uh, you think, for example, about the ancient Greek author Aristotle, uh, wrote much about happiness. Uh, sadly, the topic of happiness was suppressed for centuries in Western civilization especially during what we call the modern era. Now, it resurfaced in the last half of the 20th century, and it has become central again to our cultural dialogue. What we're going to do is we're going to begin a series of five answers to the same question, do you want to be happy? What we're going to do is do two this month, November, take a little break, Father Ben Bradshaw will be here in December, and then I'll come back in January and do three more answers to the question, do you want to be happy? There are a multitude of resources, and uh, unfortunately we didn't have the handout prepared today, but we'll have one next time, which will include this week's handout and next week's handout, because I include on there some resources that you can research on your own on the internet. I'm going to give you some of those today. If you want to write them down, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll have them available, and it will be on the St. Leo's Lunch website. Okay? So, to begin, again, let's go back. The question is, do you want to be happy? Now, this week, of course, being Thanksgiving this week, it's appropriate that we begin here with the answer of thanks, thanks, gratitude. One of the benefits of the question of happiness or the topic resurfacing in the 20th century is that we now have methods to produce data to show how happiness can actually be increased. And the results of this research confirm what we Catholics believe, how we celebrate, how we live, and how we pray. <clears throat> the first point about the research is that grateful people are happy people. As a matter of fact, in all of the research concerning happiness, this is one of the results that appears over and over again in the data. I'm going to suggest that if you wanted to look at a couple of sites, you could go to Life Live Science and see this article on how gratitude improves happiness. And then Time Magazine itself had a great article on the health benefits of gratitude. I'm going to share with you this a little photo. I hope you can see this well enough. Those are pancakes on a table. Actually, it was our table. And I woke up early one morning from a nightmare. And in the nightmare, all of our children had been killed. For those of you who don't know, I'm married. We've been married 31 years. We have seven children. Uh, and we have three grandchildren. Now, at the time, none of our children were married yet. I was in the habit of making pancakes every Saturday for our children. And on this particular Saturday morning when I woke up early from that nightmare, I had a choice in front of me. 
I could have done it the same old way as I did before. But what I decided to do this time was to make the letters of their name in pancake. And so when they woke up that morning and they saw it, you know, every morning they say, you know, thanks, Dad. But that morning was very special. And it was very powerful to me. And it was one way for me to show my gratitude and I hope increase the happiness in our family. Now, among the children we have are two sets of twins, two sets of twin boys. Uh, the two in the green t-shirts are, in the front is Joshua and then Joel, and they look quite a bit alike. And behind them are Matthew, and then on the other side with the cap is Luke. Now, among the researchers who do research on happiness, sometimes there are psychologists uh, who also do twin studies. In particular, this one time, a uh, psychologist who also is the father of twins decided to determine the happiness of his twins who were opposite. Joel and Joshua look a lot alike, they act a lot alike, but Matthew and Luke, almost because like they're on the other side of the van, are opposite. Uh, when Matthew is cold, Luke is hot, and when Luke is cold, Matthew is hot, and, and when Matthew sees things half empty, Luke sees things half full, etc. So one day this psychologist father decided I'm going to do a little experiment. It was the birthday of their twin boys and he decided to take Matthew's room and he filled it with gifts and toys. And then he took Luke's room and he filled it with horse manure. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and he walked by Matthew's room and he was crying. And he went in and he said, Matthew, what's wrong? He said, this is horrible. All my friends are going to hate me. Now they're going to be envious of me because I got the best toys in the world. And I'm going to have to buy all these batteries. And what happens if something breaks? <laughs> Matthew's the eternal pessimist. So then he walked over to Luke's room. And he saw Luke jumping up and down. And he opened the door. And he said, Luke, what's wrong? And he ran to him and he said, Dad, thanks. And his dad said, why? He said, well, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> One of the researchers that I've been following for a few years on gratitude is a woman by the name of Jacqueline Lewis. Several years ago, Jacqueline started a research on gratitude based on watching her mom die. And her mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and she was given three months to live, but she lived 20 months. And she thinks the reason her mom lived so long is because every time somebody would come up and say, oh dear, what can I do for you? She would say, do something beautiful, good, thankful for someone else in my name. So what Jacqueline did is she invited other people to also give thanks. And she's identified on her gratitude map all the places throughout the world where people can give thanks. So I'd like you Get a chance, maybe later on, go to gratitude.crowdmap.com and add your thanksgiving to what Jacqueline is do there all over, the, all over the world. Jesus Christ gives thanks to his heavenly Father. And the New Testament Greek word for thanks is Eucharist. Now you might know this, some of you probably do, but I'm going to make a connection for you right now. Jesus gives thanks to his Father because it's in his nature. In other words, as the second person of the Blessed Trinity, he loves his Father so much. Naturally, automatically, he wants to say, Abba, Dad, thanks. And the great news for us is that when he invites us to imitate him, we also are invited to 
spontaneously, like second nature, habitually, develop the habit of saying thanks. Now, there are two contexts in particular where Jesus uses the word Eucharist. Eucharisteo is actually the Greek word. And those two contexts are the multiplication of the loaves and fish and the Last Supper. So in Matthew's rendition, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. Notice, he gave thanks before he distributed them. And then the second context, and he took bread, this is the Last Supper now, before he suffers and dies, knowing what's going to happen to him, what does he do? He gives thanks. Knowing the bad that's going to happen, he gives thanks. Knowing the betrayer is sitting at the table with him, he gives thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So, if you want to be happy, then give thanks always. So thanks for joining us today at St. Leo's Lunch. For those of you who might or might not be Catholic, especially those of you who aren't Catholic, you're always welcome to worship with us in a Catholic church. And if you don't know of one, at the end, you can ask me, and I'll guide you and direct you to one, because we'd love to have you at the Eucharist, giving thanks to God our Father. These are some discussion questions, but before we get to a discussion, I'm going to invite Brian Watson to come on up and give us a little testimony. Um, the Leo's Committee... Um, one of the things we met and talked about is not only making arrangements to um, uh, seek out really good live content for us to uh, be around, to, um, to encourage us to uh, make a friend and be a friend and invite someone new here. So uh, we're blessed to have Mark, but we thought, you know, something's missing. Um, uh, the, and Mark is teaching and has this great handout on how to produce a three-minute witness talk. So basically to explain how his story changed mine. So uh, in three minutes or less, uh, I'm going to try to do that. Uh, yeah, they're taking bets as we speak. But uh, 12, thir all right, 12, 13. So... Uh, I'm Brian Watson, I'm over at St. Anne Bartlett, and I am a clueless cradle Catholic. And um, went public school kid, uh, tried to go to CCD, as many of you know it, catechism. Still don't even know what that stands for, that's how clueless I am. But I know that it means Sunday school. So uh, did that, pretty much just stayed, I stayed Catholic even through my 20s and 30s, even though I didn't go to church because I was just too lazy to learn someone else's words and rituals. I at least knew ours, and I could fake it well just going, staying Catholic. Well, let me just zoom forward real quick. And uh, I was, 21 years ago, I've been married to one of the most awesome women uh, that any man could pray for, Kirsten. Kirsten and I have two girls, and my oldest was at St. Anne Bartlett, and uh, we just put her in there. And it was second grade, and she's 16 now, and my wife said, there's no way I'm going to let my daughter get first communion, and I'm not going to. So she went into RCIA and became Catholic. And as the first time I ever caught a clue about my faith, when she brought home her material, I'm going, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So not too long after that, I became a knight because C.J. Birdie finally won and broke me down, and I became a knight. And then, uh, and then with, at the first business meeting, I get invited to Men's Morning of Spirituality, which was January of 2009. And I got this card in my hand. I wake up on March 21st going, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. But I head off to Men's Morning by myself. 
And the first thing I encounter is you can't park here. This is where the priests park. I go, okay, I'll figure it out. So I figured it out. I got here. And, uh, and that was the day uh, that changed everything for me. Um, it, the typical story, there's a dozen guys that's got the same story. It's been 20 plus years since my last confession. I pray this really weird prayer in that church right there that says, come Holy Spirit. I had no idea what I was praying, but uh, 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 I, I remember uh, Father David Graham's confession. I remember, I remember nothing or I remember everything um, of the day that I went home a completely different way and knew everything was going to be different from that day on. I can't explain. All I can have, maybe I can compare it to uh, seeing the ocean for the first time. Just a complete paradigm shift of just the way I looked at everything after that day. So since then, we didn't have a Fishers of Men, so Deacon Chip and I volunteered to start that at St. Ann Bartlett. So most of my head knowledge came from trying to put together material for us guys. I've been doing that at St. Ann since 2009. We, we had such a big growth at the, in the beginning that they even asked us to host the next Men's Morning. So Men's Morning 5 was at St. Ann Bartlett, Deacon Harold Sivers, somewhere there. So all I can tell you is every day I, I, I get better head knowledge. He gave me heart knowledge way before head knowledge because I still don't know much, but I'm learning every day. But, but the grace that came in that day and said, everything I've ever given you is now mine, and, um, and I want you just to be still and listen for a minute and let the Holy Spirit guide me to every decision I've been trying to make ever since. Um, so that's, that's basically it in a nutshell. There's not much to it. I got 1216. That's three minutes. All right. Good job. All right. All right, brothers. Here are some discussion questions. Why don't you gather around your table and start answering some of these, please. Definition of happiness is uh, to be gleeful. 